Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Um, if you were expecting David Powell from Mersey Travel, I'm sorry. Um, I don't look anything like him. Um, he's currently looking at something to do with um, mechanical engineering colleagues of ours down in Derby. Um, so you've got the B team today, I'm afraid. Um, I'm Mark Cleave from uh, Mersey Travel. Uh, I'm in the rail development team. Um, I'm currently client project manager for a couple of schemes that are going on in our area and today I'm hoping that I'm going to be able to give you a bit of a flavour of the sort of things that we're looking at from a local authority point of view, um, not just in, in my project management side or in the, the rolling stock side but looking at it in the, in the bigger picture. Um, Mersey Travel, for those of you who don't know, um, or even those of you who do know, Mersey Travel is the, the, P, the former PTE. We are effectively the, the public transport arm of the Liverpool City region. All sorts of new badges and all sorts of new corporate imagery that we're supposed to have, but basically the, the, the job carries on. Um, I heard before the break a few people from further afield than perhaps just the northwest. How many people have not seen this map before or something similar to it? Well, Few of you. Okay, most of you are familiar with it. Okay, this is basically the, the Mersey Rail map. In one form or another, we've had this going for quite some time. Merseyside, um, from the 1974 reorganisation, was five districts. And then when we became part of the Liverpool City region, we had the five districts. So that's Wirral, uh, Liverpool City there, Sefton up in the north, Southport down to Bootle, uh, Nosley around the back down to uh, Halewood and then we had St Helens over here and then with Liverpool City Region we also took in the Halton area which brings in Roncorn and Roncorn East stations and, and Witness as part of our interest. At present there's all sorts of uh, peculiarities with, with ticketing arrangements so I won't, I won't go into those um, in, in any detail but basically the rail network forms three systems there. Um, we've got the northern line, the blue coming in from the top, the Wirral line over on the sunny Wirral, hey, that's where I live, and uh, the city line, uh, which, is basically, which used to be basically bringing in all our diesel services into Lime Street main line, but now, shall we say, is the overhead, rail part, uh, overhead electric part of the, the rail network. We do have a few, as you see there, a few diesel services going out to Trans Pennine and, and East Midlands <laughs> that are still diesel, assuming that we don't have too many blockages between Lime Street and Edge Hill. <laughs> if, if we look at this historically, though, um, it, it's interesting to see what's going on. We have here um, the bit, that's, that's Edge Hill there. This is the old Liverpool Manchester Railway and also curves over there somewhere. And, and basically that came down here through the Wapping Tunnel down to the South Docks. This is the Pierhead area, the, the, the centre of Liverpool here. As the railways developed, they all want, and the, the docks moved further and further downriver, northwards downriver. The railways wanted to come in around the back, because this is a fairly sizable hill here. They tended to come around the back and fill up all these docks here. So it was very much an important thing to be able to get access through to the ports and so on. What's now happened is that gradually with the, the change of the, the shipping regimes, um, a, a lot of attention on the railways has now turned to actually getting people in and out of the uh, city centre. And this is something uh, that goes back, as you see there, to March 1972. I remember all these smiley face trains on, on all the imagery of the time. But you notice there that what we have is we've, we've still got those three same lines, the Northern, the City Line and the Wirral, <coughs> but they all come into stubs here in the middle of, Man uh, middle of the city. And if you wanted to go up to Southport, um, you, you would come into Lime Street, and then there was a, a once in every wit and while diesel service that went up to Bootle and then up to, up to Southport. So that was a bit of a problem for actually getting around and about. Back in the 1960s, uh, there had been a, a land transport survey study done in the whole of the Merseyside area, even though the term Merseyside, as we now know it, had, didn't exist at that stage. And that proposed quite a few things. Um, there are various historical books on it which show you how we ended up with the, the loop line uh, that we have in the, the city centre and the link line. But effectively, they had this great vision that some of the, the lines around the back of the city would be reopened and that we would also do various bits and pieces of work to, to improve in the, in the actual city centre here. So we've got the loop line there, we've got the link line that comes through, and then we've got this interesting one here that comes out south out of Central 
underneath Liverpool University and out onto what is the Edge Hill, <coughs> Highton, Newton Willows and Manchester that way. We're also looking at reopening a line here through down the south coast of the uh, south bank of the river and then onto the Hunts Cross through to Widnes, Warrington and Manchester that way. Um, and also up here we've got line that goes up to Kirby, uh, now truncated, and it, but it used to go on to Wigan and then Manchester in that way. Three different railway companies, those three, there that went between Liverpool and Manchester. By the time we got to 1977, we'd actually got the loop line built, and you can see there a bit of an extension there down to the south uh, underway. And since then, there have been various bits and pieces that have been improved, and we've gradually electrified various bits, uh, bits of other lines. So we now actually have a, an electric service south from Rock Ferry right through to Chester and down as far as Ellesmere Port. Um, and Yes, we've got the line out to Kirby there. That's electrified now. That was electrified in the 1970s. But we put all this in in the 1970s. Slab track. I seem to remember from my days at school that it was one of the first uses of slab track in the country. No objection, so <laughs> hopefully it was. Um, the, the tunnel bore, I believe, is actually quite small for a railway tunnel, and some of the curves are actually quite tight. So the, the beauty of having the slab track is obviously that it doesn't shift around too much and the, the, basically the carriages don't smack into the sides. The problem is that we run a quite an intensive service from about half past five in the morning to about quarter past midnight uh, most days of the week. So again, we were talking about the, the, the three-hour possession window. Yes, we get three-hour possession windows, and then by the time we turn the power off, and then you've got to do your work, and then you've got to stand clear so you can turn the power back on again, we can be down to even an hour and a half or whatever for our nighttime possessions. So not a lot was done on the loop and link line until a few years ago when we started doing the, the new track between the, the various stations. And we're actually in the process now of doing uh, a major piece of work um, underneath the river. The beauty of being a very centred um, conurbation like Liverpool and having a dedicated train service, the, the blue line and the, the green line both running on third rail systems, is that we work closely with Mersey Rail, the train operator, and we work closely with Network Rail. So we've been able to come up and work up this large package of work so that we can actually benefit from doing various bits and pieces Back in January, we closed the line underneath the River Mersey so that they could do some work um, through the, the actual tunnel itself. That's still a traditional track on ballast. Uh, but we're also having work done at the platforms around the, uh, the, the loop and link, uh, around the, the green loop line there. So various bits and pieces of work going on for the first time in 40 years. <coughs> There was a very big marketing campaign beforehand. The marketing campaign goes on as well now. Um, some social friends of mine say, excellent, first time in 40 years you've done any work. Well, we've had our money's worth out of this, so yeah, we can put up with the inconvenience. Other people are saying, oh, it's taking me another 20 minutes to walk across town to get up to, to work or whatever. So there's interesting um, concepts that we're looking at there, um, working out how we're able to uh, deal with all the, the public reaction. Because obviously, as the local authority in this, one of the important things is that we want to make sure that we keep the people out there um, understanding of what's going on and make sure that when they do come back to the rail that they do actually come back to the rail and that they don't disappear off into their cars or whatever. Uh, this afternoon you're going to get uh, a talk on uh, some, some bits and pieces, shall I say, uh, going on at Lime Street Station, quite a significant remodelling. But basically if we group those together, what we end up with is about a £340 million package. There's various other bits and pieces going on. We've got some uh, line reopenings and some new stations going in as well. These are the two electric lines which Mersey Rail Electric's train operating company deal with. And, of course, we rebuilt the tracks 40 years ago. Um, we were using, at the time, old LMS-built, uh, mainly, uh, rolling stock from the 1930s. That was fairly aged and past its uh, prime. So... We got some 507s and we got some 508s and basically for the last 40 years those two units, uh, classes of unit have been running those services there. So of course 40 years on those two, uh, two classes of trains themselves are actually getting quite aged 
and uh, we've refurbished them a couple of times. 2003, we refurbished them again. 2010, the idea was that we were trying to eat them out until we decided what it was that we were going to do. Various scenarios were, were put to us, um, and we looked at. Do, um, I won't read all these bits and pieces out here, but look at the range of options there in the middle to do nothing, carry on refreshing them. They talked about re-engineering as well. Um, they're aluminium bodied stock, I'm sure many of you are familiar with these in various parts of the, the country. I think, was it Liverpool Street to Stratford have had them recently, and I think Great Northern out of Moorgate in, in London have, um, have a class of these as well. Uh, but in the end, we decided that we would actually go for replacement as the, uh, the, the best option for us. OK, how do we do it? Us rail people knew that it was a bit more, um, bit more difficult than just going down the local <coughs> garage and asking, can we have uh, some trains to replace the 59 that we've got already? Um, despite trying to tell our colleagues, they, they couldn't see what the difficulty was. But anyway, we, we developed and created a, a rolling stock team and David Powell, who was hoping to have been here this morning, um, is the programme director for that rolling stock team. His background and many of his colleagues that he brought in onto the team um, is actually in quite a bit of light rail work. And he, he had some dealings with both the, the Manchester system and the, the Nottingham system. So it actually brought in a fresh um, thought process into just we are, we're just buying a new set of trains to go on the, the tracks that we have now. Let, let's go back to the first principles, as it were, and see what it is that we've got. If you look at the ages there, it was desperate. We couldn't keep going on and refurbishing and refurbishing and refurbishing. We were heading off into the, um, into the abyss of being the oldest rolling stock, I think apart from the Isle of Wight, that are still working on their old London transport stuff. We wanted things like improved safety. The, the world has moved on. The expectation from the, the passengers has moved on. Um, everybody expects Wi-Fi and um, tea and coffee machines and all the other bits and pieces and paraphernalia that you get on modern trains. We won't be having tea and coffee machines actually on the trains, but uh, certainly many of our stations uh, working with Mersey Rail, we do have, I think there's about 10 of them now, have um, local shops, as it were, the m to go concept, where it's a bit like your local petrol station. You can go in and you can buy some emergency uh, supplies or buy your, your sandwiches for lunch or whatever. Oh, and by the way, you can also buy a ticket down to London if you want to, or your ticket home in the evening. So we looked at a number of these different factors, and we also looked at what was going to happen in the long-term rail strategy, because, like many people, and like we've already heard today, there is this desire to see growth on the, the transport um, network. We also carried out some work with Passenger Focus. Um, yeah, it's great for us professionals to be able to sit in our ivory or as a black tower down, in, down, down on the waterfront in, in Liverpool there and come up with all these sort of great concepts, having read magazines about what, how we think that the railway network should go. But what was it the general public out there, the passengers that we use, what, what do they want? So this work was done, passenger focus. Uh, we, we've done since then some modifications of the, of the network, but you see there quite a lot of the facilities that the, 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 uh, the passengers were, were wanting for our trains. And then there's the, it's OK for London, but it won't work here, and don't take all the seats out. That, that's an interesting one. That's the, this concept of, of, of people having to stand to go on a train journey. We don't like that over on Merseyside. We, we like to sit down. Um, one of the things that often comes across my desk from um, some passengers is, you haven't got any toilets on the train. Why can't we have toilets on the train? Well, typical journey time between stations is only two or three minutes. Um, we did look at this a few years ago, and we're conscious, obviously, of DDA requirements and all the rest of it. And so we were concerned, again, because of the capacity, that toilets on trains were going to take up an awful lot of space and not be used very often. Um, I'm sure many of us have been on trains where the toilet's been locked out of use as well because there's been vandalism or misuse of it or whatever. So we actually put in um, a, a programme many um, of about 10 years ago now, of actually installing toilets in the railway stations themselves. 
advantage. Many of the stations have got uh, spare rooms that, that they aren't used. Uh, stations are connected up to the main drainage. We don't have to have controlled emission toilets. We don't have, a, have tanking facilities in the depots or anything like that. So we were fortunate here because we had a, um, a high frequency and frequently stopping network that, that we could actually provide some more facilities that passengers want but not necessarily on the trains. What the rolling, rolling stock team have done is, again, looked at a, a bigger approach. It's not just a case of going down and ringing up somebody and buying in 50-odd new uh, sets of trains or whatever. They've looked at the whole thing. And we're doing a total route modernization on those two lines, the blue line and the green line. So we're looking at the depots. Most of the, layout, the, 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 the two big depots at Kirkdale and at Birkenhead North have actually been there in that form, shape and form, since probably the days of going back to steam days. Now, that's probably not very clever when you're dealing with uh, high technology rolling stock or whatever these days. We're also looking at infrastructure. You saw the historical map just even of the, the Liverpool area, and that's taken from the, is it the 1904 Railway Clearing House book, I think it is. And you can see there all the different colours of all the different railway companies that came into Liverpool. Platform heights are big and small, long way away, close to, and all the rest of it. Now, obviously, that's quite a difficulty if you're looking at, the, say, the Roncorn, Liverpool South Parkway, Lime Street line, where we've got 100 mile an hour Pendolini thundering through, we've got local pacer trains, we've got um, London Midland trains coming through, we've got freight liners coming through with big transatlantic containers on them. So loading gauge is quite an issue there. But on many of the branches on the network, it is just those electric trains. Now why is it that you have to step up a foot or so to get from the platform onto that train? Just because that's the way that the platform was built 50, 60, 70 years ago, 100 years ago, whatever. Um, I'm going to be a bit um, radical here, um, and especially as it's not my field. What is the ideal height for a platform coper to the track? 915 metres. 915. Minus 25 plus zero. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> I knew it was around 900 and something somewhere. <laughs> what is the typical height of a railway carriage floor to the rail? 1100. 1100? Yeah. OK, so you eight inches of drift already. Now, that can be quite a bit for a lot of people. Now, earlier, John Dora was talking about small wheels and so on. I think, did you say it was 950, three foot or whatever? Three foot, three foot. Yeah, um, is, is the typical wheel size. Because some of the, the rolling stock team have looked at, uh, have had experience in, in doing light rail systems around the country, they, they sort of looked at it at first principles and asked the question, well, why can't we put the carriage floor level closer to the coping height. And as I understand it, what we're actually going to end up with is a floor height of about 960 in relation to the 915. Now, that has all sorts of interesting implications as regards um, the, the actual platform and uh, train interface, which I'll come on into a moment. How do we go about this? Well, as I say, it's not a case of just going down your local car garage or, and saying, can we have a, um, a railway train instead of a Ford Focus or whatever. And so we went through a very intensive um, and extensive uh, process working with Mersey Rail and with Network Rail to actually build up this um, way of getting our new trains. And we have ended up with that. You might have seen that in the recent press. That's what we're ending up with. The Statler unit is articulated. That's a, a novelty for... Uh, I don't think we've had articulated since the early 70s on the, on the UK network. Jacob's bogies. No idea what a Jacob's bogie is in relation to any other. I'm sure the mechanical engineers will know what that means. I thought Jacob's made cream crackers myself. Um, notice there the main traction, still 750 volt third rail but we've got a 20 uh, kV overhead upgrade. Because we're looking to the future, uh, the existing network is indeed third rail. We've got our eye on one or two smallish extensions. We've got our eye on one or two larger extensions, which could be useful branches into the uh, city centre. We've also seen the letter from the ORR uh, a couple of years ago where they said, 
no more third rail whatever. And then there was a guidance note, I believe, that was published a bit later on, which said no more third rail unless it's absolutely necessary. And we're looking at that. There are a couple of schemes that I'm dealing with, and I know um, a couple in the room here um, have, have uh, been involved in those investigations. But we do understand, that, and particularly when we started this procurement process, the whole idea of this um, wiring up of the Northwestern network well, it was very much flavour of the month. It was going ahead quite nicely. It's perhaps uh, slowed down a bit now. But one of the things that we've done is we've got these new trains to be ducted, ready for having 25 kV uh, pantographs put on, um, depending on where we want to do it. Um, one of the things that we would... That, so, so we have that retrofit opportunity, and obviously if the, the network does expand seriously, then we're in the position that we might need to buy more trains, and if that's the case, then we will look at... Uh, having those trains with the pantographs fitted from, from day one. Obviously, there's all sorts of logistical issues if you're going to have only some of the fleet running with pantographs and others running uh, dual voltage. OK, that's what it looks from the side, and the, the image at the bottom there is, is just one half uh, or the other. Um, cycling is a big issue around our way, so we've got space for cycles there. Um, a wheelchair there, and then that's mirrored over on the opposite side. One of the things, again, we've brought up from London, um, not allowed to say that, but this is these wide connections here, walk-through corridors, no, uh, uh, no doors or anything like that there are at present, and all these uh, with, with a good vestibule here with big stand-back areas and so on. It, um, the, the seating capacity is about the, the same as the existing rolling stock, uh, but the actual carrying capacity is much better. There's a much better layout here for, uh, for, for actually um, standing during the crush uh, periods. The crush period is actually relatively short. Certainly my experience going from James Street back over to the Wirral is that probably quarter to five to about half past five um, is when you get some serious standing going on in the train. But otherwise, um, if we've got enough capacity where people could enjoy and have a decent sit, then, then, then that would be absolutely ideal for us. OK, there we go. Step three. No, we haven't built that yet. That is actually a mock-up. I don't know how they've done it, but anyway, that, that's effectively what it should look like. At present, that, that's a picture of a train in um, Southport Station, and the, there we have to rely on having ramps to get people off uh, in wheelchairs or buggies if they can lift it off. Notice this little bit here. Okay. Again, some more imagery there um, that have come through from Statler. Um, with the idea so that you um, help straight on. One of the things that we do in our stations is that we have all of them, apart from a few down in Cheshire, all of our stations are staffed first till last, but many of the stations have actually got a single member of staff. So one of the issues at present is that if you've got somebody who's booked in for a, uh, a wheelchair access, they've actually got to close off the, the ticket office for a while. But at least we do have that opportunity at present to be able to have station staff helping people onto the, onto the rolling stop. One of the innovations that they're looking at is a red, amber, green um, system for getting, making sure that passengers are aware, a visual system. Um, we do have bleepers on the doors. Uh, we don't have the flashing lights that some of the, uh, the northern trains have been retrofitted with. But the idea is that as soon as the doors are open, you have that green haze around it. And then once the bleeper starts going, it turns to amber. And then finally, as the doors start shutting, um, that, that's turned to red as a, a visual indicator. We're also talking about other bits and pieces uh, of modern day kit that can go on here. The James Street accident. You might remember from a few years ago, there was a girl that got off a train, it was fairly late at night, um, then wanted to get back on the train. The train moved off and she fell down the gap. Um, ironically, it was actually at James Street Platform 1, which is one of the few very straight, only straight platforms that we have on the underground network. But effectively what had happened was that she <coughs> fell down that gap there. This was one of the issues that we wanted the train um, 
proposes to, to come up with. And what, what this company has done, and bearing in mind this is Statler, this is what's known as a Toberone here. Um, and, and effectively what that does is that front, the, the outer edge of that Toberone is level with the, or is, is vertically in line with the front edge of the Copa. So it is our attempt at trying to stop people from falling down the gap between the platform and the, the train itself. If you fell against that, you would slide down the, the carriage and effectively the Toblerone would push you back onto the, um, on, onto the copa of the platform. Yes, OK, an arm might drop down the gap because that's about 300 mil, I believe, from the, the edge of the Toblerone to the, to the front of the platform, or your leg might drop down, but at least it's nigh on impossible for you to be able to roll through the gap and down onto the track. So we believe that that's going to be a safe issue. One of the other issues is I talked about having the copers at 915, having the floor height at 960. These are actually moving steps here. So they come out and then marry up so that, and there are sensors on them so that they will stop when they get to the front face of the copa. There'll be a gap of about that much and there'll be a, a lip where the step slides in underneath the floor of about that much. But basically, it's as step-free as you're easily going to get for self-access um, self for somebody in a wheelchair. So there we go, sliding step. The gap close of the Toblerone. The visible assistance system, the red, amber, green around the door frames. The CCTV cameras. One of the issues that we've got with the existing train design is that, imagine I'm, on the, I'm the guard looking down the train that way, the passengers are getting on there, I get on the back cab and the door closed button is that way. So I've actually got my back to any passenger who's thundering down the stairs trying to get onto the train. So that was one of the issues that came out of the James Street accident. Automated warning so that people, audio and, and visual warnings so that people know when the doors are shutting. Then on the inside, um, that's, that's one of the views with the door shutting there. Large stand back area here. Uh, we tend to find that people will come onto the, the vestibule, and even though there are a couple of bays down, there are some seats that are vacant, they won't bother actually pushing their way through in the, in the peak hour, particularly if there's somebody that's close-ish in the way, they'll tend to all huddle around, which can actually be very annoying for those who are trying to then get on and actually have a longer journey and are quite happy to go and sit down. So the whole idea of these vestibules, a lot of work was done on that to, to design them in such a way that people would stand back from the door so that we can get the maximum width here. This pole here, grab pole, um, it's a double pole so that you could have lots of people with similar heights and so on. Um, as they're, they're standing around in the, the vestibule there. Driver's cab. We haven't got a full cab, but we haven't got interconnectors either. Uh, but that's the, the, uh, the mock-up of the, the driver's cab. I won't go into all the politics, but I'm sure a number of you will have read that this train, like most other trains that you buy these days, um, the doors are capable of being closed by the driver. Um, whereas at present, the current fleet that we have, we have to have a second person doing those <coughs> operations. Um, the view that we would like to put over is that the, the person in the back cab, when we're in the underground area, that is currently um, pressing the button to close the doors will actually um, be usefully employed walking through the train and speaking to the passengers, making sure that everything is all right, they have their uh, connections, they, they know where they're going and so on. So that, that's something do watch in the press over the next few uh, weeks or so. We've got a strike plan for the March the 13th, I think it is, so make sure you don't have any meetings in Liverpool that day. I think Northern are on strike that day as well. That's the timeline for the rolling stock. So not too long now, actually. I mean, if we're in a third of the way through 2017, we, um, hopefully we'll, we'll start seeing things happening fairly soon. 
I talked about the extension of, of the network. Um, the, there is a possibility of buying additional, another 60 units, as I believe. We're looking at uh, what sort of opportunities we have there, and, and possibly this whole concept of IPEMU battery power or whatever may be something that, that will crop up in the future. We don't know. That's a back to the future map. 2011, that was the last time we looked at that. Um, number of things going on. We've got new stations. My, my day job is McGill North up there. Um, colleagues down the road have got one at Warrington West, which we've called Chapelford for many years. Uh, we've got a scheme here to reopen Holton Curve, which will give us access into Chester from Lime Street, but more importantly, get the trains to call at South Parkway for the airport. Um, and then there's also concepts of opening the Bootle branch, which at present is only used as freight route into the docks here. Um, North Mersey branch there. Um, St Helens Link, that's an interesting one. As, because it sort of goes in that direction. So how does that actually serve Liverpool? Bursco Curves up here is another way to get into Southport. A lot of interesting politics on that. Um, a lot of interesting um, cost-benefit analysis on that one as well. And, and my, my, my other day job is Skelmersdale branch. That's actually building a completely new railway. Um, not even using the old railway line, but completely new railway into Skelmersdale. Skelmersdale is the second largest town in the northwest that doesn't have a railway connection, I believe. Um, it was built in the days when the car was going to be king, so there's plenty of capacity there. It's going to be an interesting project. I know one or two of you have already worked on it. Um, I'm sure will have found it interesting and long may it continue. We're probably talking mid-20s to late-20s when that one actually opens. So, thank you very much. <laughs>